Steve, why don't you come on up? I want to introduce you guys to a really good friend of mine, Steve Wong. Uh, Steve uh, and I got to be friends. Uh, he's, our, he's our guest speaker uh, this morning. I am? You, uh, you better be. <laughs> I, thought, I thought I was saying hi. Oh, boy. No, seriously? Really? Yeah, you're okay. preaching. We'll try. Um, so, so Steve and I got to know each other when I was a college pastor at uh, University Covenant Church in Davis, and Steve uh, was on staff with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, uh, also on the, on the same campus. Got to be friends then. And uh, over the years, have taken, we've taken turns being each other's pastors. So he, he came to my church in Davis, and then I went to his church when I lived in Pasadena. And uh, just our friendship just has grown. Yeah, he's one of the few people I know who's been both a senior pastor. He's the senior pastor at um, Pasadena Covenant. He's also been a worship director. So he, he can actually do uh, both of those jobs and, uh, and do them well. And uh, just really uh, respect Steve and just his wisdom, his reverence for scripture, his love of the church. And uh, I've been asking him ever since I came. I was like, oh man, you gotta come and preach in my church. And we finally uh, pried him away from Pasadena the Covenant and got him to come up here and uh, share the word with us. And so welcome. We're so, so glad you. you're here. Thank you. Uh, let me say a prayer. Lord, we just thank you for Steve and uh, just his presence. We just ask that you would just give him your words to speak and that we could just hear from you through him. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Thank you. Uh, Let's see. Let's try this. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Good morning. Uh, Zosan. Does anybody speak Cantonese here? Zosan. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Mandanga umaga? Any, you know, Filipinos? Yeah, buenos dias. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to be here again. My name is Steve. I'm a worship, uh, I'm in the lead pastor at Pasadena Covenant Church, but what a joy it is to be with you all. Uh, yes, uh, Matt, Joy, uh, Hannah, Peter, Abby, um, we, have, we have gone um, and experienced different things that, together, and that has been the, and we've, we've crossed paths, and it's, I think that's part of the joy as we, we get older and we see one another and we're surprised at what God does in our lives. And isn't that true for the church? that sometimes we just cross paths and for this very moment and we have to be open and aware of what God is doing in our midst for that moment. You can't think too far in the future because you don't know what the future holds. All you have is today. All you can do is say, God, what do you have for me right now? And, and I want to invite you this morning as we come here today, for some of you this might be your very first time, for some of you this might be your hundredth time that you've been at church, but there's always a fresh word for us. There's always something that uh, we come in this morning anticipating that, that God, as we've talked about, is chasing after us. This good God is pursuing us, and he has something for us. Do you believe that? Amen? Do you want the word of God to come in and transform your life, to liberate you from some things that, that might have been holding you down, that you don't want to carry anymore? Because I think... Uh, we, we can do that every moment of the day. We believe that God is present, but sometimes when we come together, there's an anticipation that God wants to do something, and it, it's not just for, for us individually, but for us as a church. There's a transformation that happens when we come together in, as a church in person, or if you're, you're, you're joining us online, where we get to experience God's word together. And God has something for us to liberate us from to free us from, to invite us into God's kingdom that I hope, as God has been speaking to me, uh, we can share with you. I, wouldn't, I want to share a little bit about, uh, to just let you know a little bit more about my family. Um, I'm Chinese-American. I've got two kids, one wife. Uh, Kai, there's a picture of us. Um, Kai is 10. He's just figured out how to solve a Rubik's Cube. Josephine is 14 next month, and she is currently... Um, playing water polo in San Jose somewhere. I don't know if you have any water polo players. So she just joined the water polo team and this, this year, and they're in JOs and Junior Olympics. And so this, this sultry, smoky voice that you ha- hear from me is not from uh, years of smoking, but it comes from shouting and screaming um, by the stands. So I'm so glad. Um, Emily June and I met in InterVarsity at UC Davis our freshman year in a Bible study. It was not love at first sight. Not for her side, at least. It's more like a game of tag that we played for six and a half years but until God said, okay, really, no, seriously, get married. Um, another fact about me is I lived on two continents, 21 homes, uh, grew up in Singapore for a part of my life. Uh, needless to say, I'm used to being on the move. 
And one thing that you have to realize is when you're on the move, you go to a new place, there's a, there's a moment after the novelty of going to a new place wears off. You go, okay, what now? There's a sense of unfamiliarity. I want to go to that coffee shop just to sit and to be. Or I want to have fun, or I want to, something happens in my life and I want to talk to that person. The internet has really helped, but there's nothing quite like sitting in your place and talking to your friend face to face, and, and you come to a place of helplessness. You come to a place of longing, of deep longing, that you're looking for, is there something, in, do you ever, ever felt that, this, that there's, there's just something missing? And you're longing for a completeness in your life. And you try to live in a way to grapple, to grasp, to go back to, you want to go back to that place where you did not feel helpless. Uh, one of the things I like to do when I go to a new place, I, I bike, um, I, I, um, I road bike, a mountain bike, I just want to explore. That's part of my way of getting out and, and, and have, experiencing my devotion with God. It's, I like to go out and explore. So I was, I was biking in the San Gabriel Mountains, um, my, my family just, we moved down from, from Davis to Pasadena four years ago, and so this was our, our latest transplant. And, um, and I was biking, uh, and I like to explore, and, and there I was, about 4,000 feet up uh, the side of Highway 2, um, and I had one bottle of water, a, a flat tire, um, no cell phone service, and 20 miles from civilization. And I, I had the great idea that morning that I wanted to ride this famous ride. You go all the way up, and then you cruise all the way back down. Um, and, uh, and I packed all the food I needed and the drink I needed, but I, as I left my block, I said, oh, I, don't, I didn't bring an extra tube. And, uh, and I see some nodding heads. You're like, oh. But I said, you know what? I just changed the tubes last night. I should be fine. No, I see some shaking heads now. They're like, what a rookie. <laughs> but I thought sunrise is coming. I don't want to miss it. My favorite thing is to ride into the sun, sunrise. And so, hey, what could possibly go wrong? Right? Famous last words. About 15 miles in, 2,000 feet up, I noticed that my back tire was starting to get a little squishy. Low, and, and lo and behold, it had a leak. And at, at that point, did I realize my folly to turn back um, and 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 go back to civilization? Of course not. Of course not. I am going to power through. I have my pump. I should just keep on, I'll just stop whenever it gets squishy, and I'll pump it up, and I'll keep on going, because I had to conquer this mountain. That worked for about a mile. And I'd stop my bike, and I'd pump it up, keep on going. But the thing about tubes is that the holes in the tubes, because they're made of rubber or latex, they start getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So, the, 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 the distance that I could bike um, grew shorter between every pump. But did I stop? Of course I didn't stop. I, I was almost there. I could see the crest. I had to get there. I needed to get there. And I was going nowhere fast. Ever feel that? Where you're, you're, you're doing whatever you can. You're stopping. You're pumping. You're taking breaks. You're taking naps. You're drinking more coffee. You're doing whatever it takes to get to the place you need to go. And you realize that you're stuck in drive. You just don't know what to do next. You're just doing everything you can because that's all you know. The funny thing is that as I was pumping my tire for, I think, probably the eighth, tenth, I, I've lost count of time. I kind of giggled to myself um, because I realized that this was going to be a fantastic sermon illustration. <laughs> so there you go. You're very welcome. Um, and and I realized that if I made it down to one piece, I was going to share this story. And, and I, I, eventually, my tire became unpumpable, unpumpable. Is that a word? I don't know. But I was at that point, I had to stop, and I had to ask for help. And this Mexican brother in a pickup truck stopped. That's another story for another day, but we had a fun, fantastic conversation and, um, on the way back down to, um, to civilization. Why is it so hard to ask for help? We used to do it a lot. I don't know if you remember. We used to do it a lot when we asked for help, when we couldn't, we, 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 we needed food, and we needed our butt wiped. 
Uh, we, 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 needed, we needed because because our pants were wet. You know, we, 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 we needed help when we, we couldn't find our, our school bag or we misplaced our lunchbox or we, we, we did, we used to be so good at recognizing our limits. We used to be so good at run, recognizing it and saying, I don't know where it is. I need help. When did we get to a place where we believed in the myth of the self-made person. How old did we become when we realized and thought, I don't need help anymore. I can't need help anymore. If I need help, I fill in the blank. Not good enough, I'm a failure, I'm a child, I'm helpless. I'm never gonna make it. What lies did we hear that if we asked for help, we are less of a human being? We sang all these songs about a God that came to save us, about a God that pursued us, about a God of a cross because we couldn't do something right and we needed help. At what point did we stop believing that as Christians? or humans. If we are really independent, then where is room for God in our life? Then God then becomes that benevolent grandfather that every once in a while when you come to visit gets really happy about that you're there and gives you some candy or money, right? Then God becomes that, that vestigial piece of us that we come every Sunday because we have, we have to. We have to pay our dues. If God isn't, the God of all things and of all power and all kindness and all justice, then we won't really need God in our lives. We don't have to ask for help, especially from God. There's a, there's a fear of shame, the fear of being revealed or exposed for who we really are. Limited human beings that don't know what happens tomorrow. That's what Jesus has talked about every single day. Why are you worrying about the hair on your head, or the, the next day when God knows every single number of hairs on your head? See, Psalm 121, as, as uh, you all have been uh, working through the Psalms, I, I, I heard that last week you guys had a great, fantastic, funny um, sermon. <laughs> and so um, I'm... <laughs> I'm going to continue. It was, it was about lament, which is fantastic. I think that we need to, we need to figure out lament a little bit more because that means that uh, we are optimistic about who God is and God alone in the midst of difficult circumstances. Psalm 121 pushes us to another way of living. This psalm is a part of a playlist called the Song of Ascents. The pilgrims sung as they made their way up to the hillside towards Jerusalem on their pilgrimage. Some scholars think that this psalm was recited in unison while others, the other pilgrims would say, sometimes they would say it's a call and response. Sometimes it was something that they would say as pilgrims would, as they were passing by other people that were on the same road. The author begins with a question that is already known. Where is my help come from? I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from you, Lord, maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you, he keeps you, will not slumber. No, he who watches or keeps you over, over Israel would neither slumber nor sleep. He who keeps you will not allow harm to come to you, whether by the sun or by the moonlight. He who keeps you watches over you. He who lives forever watches over you from now till forevermore. That's Psalm 121. Where does my help come from? What if we approached every step in our lives with the understanding that we are incapable of finishing the journey on our own? We begin our lives in full embrace of our need for help and God willing, we age into seniority, we will end our lives in need of help. 
So in between, let's practice asking help well. Why is it so hard? Because asking for help is vulnerable, right? Asking help is vulnerable, y'all. This, this is hard stuff. It means we don't have our stuff together. It means that there is something that we cannot do. We don't know how to do it. We don't have the resources to do it. Many think that asking for help is reserved for those lost at sea or trapped in a mine or for, for this matter, for my case, trapped on the side of a mountain with a flat tire. It's not for regular people like us, right? Is it? No, 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 that's not right. Being, that, that's being prideful, thinking that we have life on lock, that we are the captains of our own destiny, fulfillers of our own fates. See, pride is the obstacle that obscures our vision of reality that we are limited beings created for a relationship with a limitless, limitless, limitless God. Being vulnerable, therefore, is the key to true freedom because it puts us in full contact with the God that cares. It's a relinquishing of the tarnished crown of our own destinies and giving it to the king who let his go for our sake so that we can all live under his love and care. Which brings me to my first point, that help, help is vulnerable. But God, God is vigilant. Help is vulnerable, but God is vigilant. This psalm has one focus and one focus only, God as our keeper, who keeps us. That's an interesting word. That's kind of not a word that we usually use. We maybe think of it as a timekeeper, right? A, a person that, that, um, that, that does, has the stopwatch, a timekeeper, or a goalkeeper, somebody that prevents goals from coming in. And, and in some ways, we can think about it that way, that God is something that, that watches over us with time and makes sure that we're going at the right pace, or, or somebody that prevents you know, evil from, from happening and hitting us, right? The goalkeeper, but... But I think the idea of the keeper is best encapsulated by the idea that God is like a groundskeeper. Somebody that walks along. I don't know if you've ever really paid attention to people in an orchard or, or even a landscaper. People that, that are notice that there are weeds on the ground and, and take care. Do you know how much work it takes, how much attention it takes? The slow work of a landscaper. That's such an honorable job. Somebody that pays attention to the needs and cares of the ground around us notices what happens and provides exactly what it needs for in exactly the right time. It's somebody that understands the seasons of of, of, of the year so that it can provide the right things for that tree. The LA Times uh, recently put out an article about a young man who devoted his life to the care of oaks around the area, especially because they are at risk of invasion. I don't know if you know, there's these little beetles called the gold-spotted oak borers, these little beetles. And they leave these little tiny, it's it's super small, like a a, a one-eighth inch hole in the bark, a D-shaped hole. And and this person walks around and he can spot those holes everywhere they, he goes when it's there. Why? Because he's attuned to it. He walks in a pace that allows him to see the needs and the cares for the tree and provides the right type of assistance and some assistance to, to that tree. He works to keep it from harm day and night. If this is done by a man This care and attention is done by a man who was introduced to this craft 10 years ago. What does it mean? What does it mean for a God, an eternal God who created us, who knows us so intimately, that that crafted us, that knew us before we were even born? Psalm 8 Chapter 8, verse 4 declares, Who are humans that you are mindful of us, the son of man that you care for us? 
You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. The birds of the air, the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This author was attentive to all, to, to a God who was attentive to us, saying you took care of the birds and the sea and the trees and, the, and, and everything in between. How can that be that you're attentive to me? Oh God, how majestic. See, this word majestic we think is big and abstract. No, majestic means that he is so big and yet in this very moment, he knows exactly what you're thinking, feeling, and needing. And he wants to attend to that. Being kept by God means that we have a God, an eternal God that knows our name and says, I have you, I'm keeping you, I am on a walk with you so that the little beetles in your life that bore into your heart, into your mind, I know what to do with them. The the shame that prevents you from asking for help, actually God is speaking to you right now what, what that shame is. For me, sisters and brothers, I'll just tell you, I'm a perfectionist. If you are the, into Enneagram, I'm Enneagram 1 all the way. And I'm the person that says uh, that everything can be better, much to the chagrin and pain of my family members and my kids. I'm just like, I, I, have, to, I have to work on that as a perfectionist to recognize that we are human beings. So my fear is a fear of failure fear of incompleteness, a fear of not being good enough. And that keeps me from asking for help because I need to figure this thing out on my own. What is your fear? What is your shame? What is the thing that keeps you from from moving forward? We can hope because God, God keeps us. Help is vulnerable. We need to ask for help but God is vigilant. We need to lift up our eyes. Lift up our eyes beyond the the idols of self-independence. Lift up our idols from self-sufficiency. Lift up our idols of trying to get everything done right so that we are no longer a failure. We gotta lift, that can be an idol, y'all. Sometimes we have to try and overcome ourselves. Lift up the idol of the image that you're supposed to be something and turn to a God that had already known you since the beginning. We recognize the idols in our life that keeps us from looking to the real keeper. We need to look beyond our circumstances, beyond our wisdom, beyond our own strength, the power of our dollar, the speed of our internet, and ground ourselves in the knowledge of our limitations. This is what the psalmist says as he's walking, or she's walking, is saying, I'm walking, and I experience my life, and I'm going up a hill, and I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? That's a self-reflective question. Where does my help come from? Is it me? I think us, for, for many of us who are here in, in, in Milpitas, Pasadena even, we're in America, we're the, we're the most prosperous country in the world. We have marketed ourselves, we have exported even the idea of self independence. And rather, God, the story of the cross is one of a God who even let go of himself because he believed in a father that would rescue him. That's the God that we follow. We ground our knees in the knowledge of our limitations and lift our eyes to the maker of heaven and earth and shout, Hosanna, Lord, save us. Help is vulnerable. God is vigilant. Lift up your eyes. What does this passage say to those of us who feel like God has not been super helpful these days, even though we have lifted up our eyes? What do we say to those who, who feel like God has not been our keeper who keeps us? There might be those of us who have weary faiths. And Psalm 21 might bring us feelings of resentment or cynicism. The answers offered to us are insufficient to salve a burning desire in our soul, a longing in our soul. And and to you I say this, 
Help is personal. It's a personal thing. Psalm 121 speaks of an intimate connection between God and the pilgrim. My help comes from the Lord. He will not let your foot slip. He keeps your life. He keeps your coming and goings now and forevermore. The pilgrim is fully aware of his personal situation. The pain and suffering is here. It's now, God. Do you hear me? Do you recognize my pain from above? And yet there is an eternal reality that this pilgrim's five senses cannot comprehend or detect. Help is personal. God is eternal. There is um, the Heidelberg Catechism that addresses our personal faith, faith in the face of an eternal God. And I'll just read a part of it. It says, To believe in God and the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, is to trust him so completely that I have no doubt that he would provide me with all things necessary for body and soul. Moreover, whatever evil he sends upon me in this troubled life, he will turn to my good, for he is able to do it, being almighty God. And is he determined to do it, being a faithful father? We are to be patient in adversity, grateful in the midst of, a bless of, in the midst of blessing, and to trust our faithful God and father for the future. To look at our present, present problems in light of an eternal God is, that is almighty and faithful is to trust that while our circumstances might not hold all the answers to the questions and longings in our heart, we can take the next step because God, our eternal God, the God had, who had been at work from the beginning and will continue his work forever and forever, amen, is present in the work in our lives right now. We might not see it, we might not feel it, we might not know it, but we believe in a God that is eternal, not the one that is done or will be doing, but is doing good work in us, in our pains, in our sorrows, in our fears. We can take the next step because our God is at work for our benefit, whether or not we know it, whether or not we can see it. It's Joseph locked up in a jail before he's given authority to prevent starvation in the midst of a worldwide famine. It's the Israelites in the middle of a desert. It's Jesus on a cross. It's the day between the cross and the empty grave. Some of these stories take three days to complete. Some of them we will not see for, until generations later. And yet we hear these stories to remind ourselves that God, our keeper, keeps our comings and goings both now and forevermore. And yes, if we put our trust in him today and the day after that, forever. That's what gives us confidence in seemingly impossible situations like global conflicts. We see in Hong Kong and Myanmar and in Nigeria and Ukraine, we call on God, an eternal God who is invested in our personal lives. And so the pilgrim can exhort one another, he will not let your foot slip. So take another step. Be brave. Be courageous. But most of all, be trusting. Help is personal. God is eternal. So do this. Take another step. Trust that the footing is sure. Over and over again, God says, you may stumble, but he will not let you fall. He will not let your foot Stumble over a stone. He strengthens your ankles so you can rise up and leap like the gazelle. Uh, in passing the covenant, one of the things we do, and I know that you guys spent a year on prayer or something like that, right? You guys were a short year on prayer, a whole series on that, because we're talking about being in touch with a God that is all-powerful, almighty, all-loving. And we hold these prayer vigils where um, in passing the covenant, we believe that too. And we hold these prayer vigils 24 hours and people come into the room and they, we have different themes and we, we write our prayers on the wall and we say, God, we don't know the answers to these things, but we trust in you that you're gonna do something about it because you care. We've prayed for pastors when we were searching for them, as you have, well done. For our communities fraught with historical and systemic brokenness, ongoing, 
For our unity when the world applauds division and gives us no tools for reconciliation, we pray for these things not as lofty ideals or good wishes, but to a God who makes good on his promises. And we look to a Jesus who showed us the way of the kingdom that says reconciliation is the theme song of heaven. Let's sing it together while we are on earth. He is a good shepherd that wields a long rod and a staff to guide us on the way through the darkest valley. Help is vulnerable. God is vigilant. Lift up your eyes. Help is personal. God is eternal. Take another step. Cast off your pride. Cast off your de despair. So to, add, to the end, I would like to share a poem I wrote in, in response to this psalm as I was actually working through it. And, um, and you know, in some translations, they use watch versus keep. And so I, um, I was wrote, writing it in response to the NIV um, that uses watch instead of keep. And I'll just end with this, and then we'll pray together. This is God is your keeper. No amount of preparation will ever be enough to climb the path to heaven. No right, nor ritual, nor willful resolution, grit, courage, nor comprehension. It's nothing but you, Lord, who watches, keeps me. Not as a couch surfer or a lab coat, not a touchy librarian or a, a corner cop, no. You are a mother over her sleeping babe, a father playing catch, a brother on a long road ride, a shepherd in the night, a potter at the wheel, an artist before the sunrise, a God in love with me. You will not let my foot slip, neither slumbering nor sleeping, neither any woes that come. The shade, you are the shade at my right hand today, here, now, forevermore. Will you join me in prayer? God, we are aware that you are aware of us. But not as a disciplinarian that's taking a list of things that we have done wrong in order to discipline us and shame us. No, Lord, you are one like a groundskeeper that walks almost like when you did in Genesis, in the cool of the garden, that you walk and you tend and you care and you, you notice our deepest pains and our longings and even the fears that keep us from asking for help. Lord, we need help. We recognize the idols before us that just seem... Like if we were to just push a little bit harder, we can put that idol either behind us or on our trophy closet. But Lord, we recognize that in the midst of all of this, in the midst of our tiredness, it is you, God, who keeps us and watches over us. So we ask, God, in the midst of all of this, that we relinquish our self determination, and cast ourselves to you just as Jesus did on the cross, that we would commit our spirit to you, God our Father. Keep us, speak to us in the midst of our anxieties and woes. Thank you, Jesus, for showing the way. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us in worship today. Uh, we look forward to having you again next week. We invite you to uh, hang out on the patio, have coffee, refreshments, and just uh, get to know each other. If any of you would like prayer for any reason, we'll have a prayer team right here, and you can just come up, and it's confidential. Just share what's going on in your life, and, uh, and we will pray for you. Steve, thank you so much. We're so gr great. To, isn't it great to have Steve here? Yeah. Uh, Amen. Thank love you. Love to have you come and, come and preach again, so I hope you'll give, a, give us the benediction. Absolutely. Sisters and brothers, as we go forward, I want to have you in your ears to hear the cry of a baby, just to think about that, to know that that cry and the, the, the perhaps the attentiveness, the compassion you have on that child is, is, is something that is a glimpse of what the Father has upon us when we cry for help. Mm. He notices you. So sisters and brothers, as you, go, as you go out, may you experience the way of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit who made the way to the Father 
who loves you, is for you, and keeps you forever and ever in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.